Thanks, everybody, for being here. Good evening. Hi. Nice to see everybody. Um, I love to always ask, anybody new to the church? Any first-timers here? What? Michael Lawrence? You guys are... Come on. Oh, wow. Interesting. I appreciate your honesty. This is going to be a good discussion if he's on stage admitting he's never been here. Um, Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you all for being here. Um, We are here. My name is Sherry Pascarella. For those of you who don't know me, I am the executive director here at the church on behalf of our wonderful team amazing people who work here, and our incredible founders, April Gornick and Eric Fischel, who are here. You can clap for them because they are pretty wonderful. Um, And April actually conceived of the series, which is called Knowledge Friday. This is um, a total aberration for the forum. It's typically one person, and in the future, it will always be one person. Tonight, however, it partially inspired by this show, I, had, I was um, coming into this cultural community from the city. You don't know what you're walking into. And I was startled to find such a richness of a creative community, a historic community, and um, a, an amazing assortment of, of arts professionals who are centered around this organization, Han, which we are here tonight to discuss. And the inspiration for assembling everybody tonight actually came from the show. The current exhibition that's on view is called Master Impressions, um, Prints and Printers of the South, Artists and Printers of the South Fork from 1965 to 2010. And many of the works on view come from uh, local institutional loans, including Guildhall and the Parish Art Museum, as well as a small number of others. And in reflecting on the show, I uh, couldn't help but reflect upon the wonderful um, infrastructure of arts that we are so fortunate to have here on the East End. And what many of you may or may not know, well, how many people have heard of Han before tonight? So it's about 50%. I like to do, when people from the city ask me what Han is, I said it's the shadow organization of the Hamptons um, that wields a lot of influence, but nobody knows about it. It's very dark. Um, So here we're bringing it into the light. Uh, And that's what we're here. So the format for this evening's Knowledge Friday is we will begin with a, a brief presentation on the history of Han by one of the Han founders, my colleague, Andrea Grover. And sure, (laughs) absolutely. And then um, each Han, and then we will have a a brief comment on recent, what it's like to be a young Hani from Ms. Carrie Barrett. Um, And then we will each, each representative here of the organizations, you will see on the screen information about their organization and then they will speak for two minutes only about either their organization or their experience in Han. After that, it's up to you. So the reason why we're only two minutes each is because we want this to evolve into a dialogue where you can ask us, as your people of service to this community, questions. Are you up for that? Do you have some good questions going? I just saw a hand, you can wait 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll get underway. So without further ado, I'd like to, and by the way, um, our Han's new website just launched today. Thank you, Michael, for the assistance with that. The website, the URL is there, hamptonsarts.org. You can check it out as well, or follow Han on Instagram, um, which the Instagram is really useful because it compiles different things that different members have going on. So without further ado, I'm um, going to pass the mic over to Andrea Grover. This is a shadow organization for sure, the Han. Um, oh, wait, first you have to identify yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Andrea Grover, and I am the executive director of Guild Hall. Guild Hall has been operating continuously in East Hampton Village since 1931. It was one of the first multidisciplinary centers in the country, and its history has paralleled art history and performing arts history because of the context of our community being so um, 
full of artists and performers and writers and designers and creative professionals. So Guildhall is now 90, two years old, going on 93 years old, and we're completing a stem to stern renovation of the building. It's like a magic trick. It's a total infrastructure replacement of a historic building that maintains its um, character and scale, but operates like new construction. So that's coming to a conclusion in July when we reopen the historic John Drew Theater. We're very, very excited about that. So that's Guild Hall, and I'm Andrea. And now I'm going to talk about the Hamptons Arts Network. So the Hamptons Arts Network was founded on December 1st, 2016, at Barron's Cove in Sag Harbor during a happy hour that we, we called the Ed Happy Hour, which was Executive Director's Happy Hour. And it came about because three of us had an idea at the same time. So I had formerly been at the Parish Art Museum where I worked with Terry Sultan. I had taken a job at Guild Hall that year and we decided that we were going to build a bridge between the institutions, but why not extend that to cultural institutions on the East End? Well, it turns out there, there was synchronicity because Elka Rifkin, who is right here, who was the director of the Watermill Center, had <laughs> virtually the same idea. Um, and then there was a conduit to us, which was always an artist, artist, and that was Almond Zygmunt, who's up in the balcony there, who at the time was the program, uh, the residency coordinator at Watermill. Long story short, we thought, let's get everybody together who directs a cultural organization on the East End. We put together a list of people we called and wrote to them. We had this happy hour at Barron's Cove. We wanted it to be agendaless because we didn't really know each other. There was a time where we didn't have each other's phone numbers. So we all got together and we didn't have a name, but within a year we were the Hamptons Arts Network. We are um, a holacracy, and we are not incorporated. So we are a shadow organization. You won't find us registered anywhere except at that URL. We are self-governing, self-organizing, and the baton passes constantly between leaders of Han. So um, at times, Elka has been the agenda maker and note taker. I've been it. Terry was. Amy has been for Amy. too long. Amy Kerwin, who's at Guild Hall also, she is now kind of running the show. How am I doing on time? You have uh, one minute left. I have one minute left. Okay, so. What I wanted to say is that what we've done together is a number of kind of remarkable things. We survived the coronavirus together by monthly meetings where we shared information and resources. We tell each other about grants that are coming up. We tell each other about exciting art and artists who we've encountered. We share programming. We promote the region. We share resources. We've done economic impact studies. We created an artist relief fund during uh, the pandemic. We also um, worked with, and that the relief fund actually was spearheaded by Eric Fischel and Clifford Ross, and we worked with NIFA on that. Also, Philippe Chang, who's in the audience, did a portfolio of individuals living through the pandemic, and that also was sold to support the activities of Han. And essentially, we hold each other's hands through this kind of arduous and fun work that we do together. So that's the history of the Hamptons Arts Network. And I'm gonna turn it back to you. Sure, Okay. I'm just gonna introduce Terry. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Andrea. <laughs> and now speaking on behalf of somebody who is newer to the East End and sharing um, some reflection on, on where Han is at present and what it's like as a new person. Um, Andrea spoke from the point of view of being a founder. Um, Carrie Barrett from, uh, do we have the next slide please, Selena? There's our famous Red Garden. I'm Carrie Barrett. I'm um, the lucky director of Longhouse Reserve. I came in October of 21, about eight months after Jack Larson died, into an organization that um, Columbia Business School studies as what's called Founder's Syndrome. What happens when everything changes? And the first thing that happened to me, since I only have two minutes, it's a lot to say. I have three. Um, I think that first Friday was an 11 o'clock Zoom call with this thing called the Hamptons Art Network, which is different than the Horticultural Alliance of the Hamptons, <laughs> the Ha and the Han. Um, and I want to say, I've worked in the museum world for a very long time, and I was scared to death. 
um, because of leadership changes, because of other changes, because of friends who were gone. And I thought I was going to walk into a room and, and it, well, it was Zoom, so I wouldn't get bludgeoned, but I could have gotten a lot of stink eye. You know what? I didn't. I'm surprised. And so what I have sought out of Han for Longhouse, the largest garden in East Hampton, um, 16 acres of trees that are rare, the only redwoods on the East Coast, just extraordinary plants that need to be recorded, a collection that needs to be managed. We have a global collection in the house, indigenous works of art that Jack collected on his travels through Africa and Japan and Thailand, his own textiles, his own textiles that he collected. One of the finest, our colleague Glenn Adamson, who's our curator at large, said Jack basically invented craft, along with having invented the fabric for glass buildings on Park Avenue that made it so that you could hear yourself. He created the acoustical ability for Mies van der Rohe and Gordon Bunshaft to work. We are also, though, I'm so glad to see a number of my trustees in here, we don't talk about him so much anymore because the community, we, I want them to be so interested when they come and so enthralled when they walk, this is what it looks like on Mother's Day, to be so, like in any museum today, not the tell, tell, tell of who's our founder and what we're doing and where we came from, but for people to come in and be so immersed in our core values are now awe, wonder, responsibility, and sustainability. To be in this garden and to say, where the hell am I? And then once you've asked the question, we're happy to tell you. But otherwise, it's, not, it's just not that important. He said, after I die, open my house to the public. Marty Cohen said, just open. So somebody said at lunch today, just open and open regularly. If you say you're going to be open, be open, because it closed a lot in the past. So the best thing, you know, what was the top thing we've done over the past two years? We're open five days a week. We opened on, in mornings. Last thing I want to say, because I want this to be about Han as well, um, we will eventually open the house. Right now we're going through a permitting process to open the, with lots of approvals the ground floor so that we can continue to do exhibitions of decorative arts, Jack's collections. This summer our big exhibition is Toshiko Takeizu, his friend, the, the ceramic artist, the, the woman who made the bell. And we have a lot, a lot of her work, so we're going to combine that with some of her students, but we need that indoor space. And what we love is that people go in and then they kind of look upstairs and say, when is that going to be open? Well, that's a $16 million project, and it'll be a capital campaign. Um, I won't, I'm not 92 years in. I want to say last thing in 10 seconds that I counted, and amongst all of us here, we have a total fewer employees, oh God, a fourth of the Met, smaller than the Guggenheim. We're, I'm comparing us to big places, but one of the things that I was looking for was collective intelligence and collaboration, because some of my team are here. Thank you, Mary Gail. Thank you, Katie. I'm so glad you're here. We're 10 people, and four of them are in the garden. And to have Han as a place where I could call my colleagues and say, what are you doing about that, is exactly what we all need. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Um, so so um, I don't mean to be a taskmaster, but anybody who knows me will tell you that I am. Um, so I'm going to start using timer. And we're going to go person to person. Um, this is, these seats are arranged in alphabetical order by institution. And we're going to ask each person to pass the mic as it is in their row. So, Carrie, if you could pass the mic to the lovely Jess. Uh, and here you go, Jess Frost. Thank you, Carrie. So, yeah, my name is Jess Frost. I'm the, uh, a co-founder and the executive director of the Art Center at Duck Creek in Springs. We're a fairly new uh, organization, and we're quite sleepy. So if you haven't heard of us, I hope you'll uh, have an opportunity to um, check us out next season when we open. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how we evolved, um, again, because it's kind of a unique situation. Um, the Art Center at Duck Creek in and of itself was built around historic Duck Creek Farm, which is a CPF property. Um, in 2006, the town of East Hampton purchased this property and it sat more or less dormant for a decade 
when um, a friend of mine, Sidney Albertini, was asked to do the Parish Road Show and was looking for a location to do the show. And I showed her the, the property and she fell in love with it and proceeded to do her exhibition with the parish there in a, in a fairly dilapidated barn. Um, and at that point, the, the following season, a group of uh, neighbors in Springs decided to do some ad hoc exhibitions there. We did two shows that first summer and a concert, and then the town um, quickly decided to uh, renovate the building because they saw the value in using this property uh, as an art space. So um, at that point, we, um, we decided to, as they were basically um, renovating the space, we became a 501c3 and began navigating and negotiating with the town uh, for a, la a license on the property. Um, this makes us one of the first CPF properties to actually have a license with the town. And that license, the Community Preservation Fund, for any of you who don't know, is the 2% property tax that you pay for um, green space and community character preservation historic spaces. Um, this, this CPF funding comes with restrictions. For example, we're not allowed to sell anything. We're not allowed to do any retail activity on the property. We're not allowed to charge for tickets. And we can't rent the space, which are all ways that many nonprofits you know, build revenue. Um, so initially, with my board, this created a lot of tension because they sort of felt that this was maybe not a, a viable endeavor. But we basically, what we ended up doing was taking these restrictions and turning them into the culture of Duck Creek because everything that we do is free. We cannot charge tickets for anything. It, it puts us in a unique situation where our programming is not based on ticket sales. Our choices for um, exhibitions are not based on whether or not we can sell the artwork. So it, it allows us a freedom that a lot of organizations don't have because we, we make these choices based on how they'll impact the community. Um, Thank our, you. Our Sorry. programs, our programs are, are based on merit, not sales, not commerce. And I think that makes us extremely unique in the sense that our, everything that we do is driven by access to the, to the land. Basically, we can't stand in the way of anyone. If our doors are open, anyone who wants to come can come. And, and being Guys, able, <laughs> being really able to say- I'm not trying to be rude, but you. we have a lot of people here. <laughs> Holler at me, I'm and, happy with that. <laughs> um, and we want to give everybody an equal yeah. chance to speak. So um, am I done? thank you. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, two minutes, I, I, if you want to listen to the timer, um, it was, yeah, yeah, it goes fast. Thank you so much, Jess, for speaking so passionately. Chris, please. Hi, everyone, I'm Chris Seifert. I'm the deputy director at Bay Street Theater. Um, are we all having fun? Yeah. Come on, folks, let's get into it. Uh, thank you all for your ongoing support, attendance, and patronage, because it is because of all of you that the arts are alive and vibrant in our region. Yes, so, very thank true. You. Bay Street Theater is a 299 seat regional theater on the wharf in, La in Sag Harbor for uh, 33 years. Our mission is to innovate, educate, motivate, and entertain through the performing arts collaborations and partnerships. We're an economic engine in the village of Sag Harbor, $5 million a year, um, simply in our direct expenses. We offer, uh, we have 15 employees that work year round and another 100 plus that are hired for seasonal employees. <clears throat> We're proud of our partnerships with dozens of organizations and individuals, everyone on this stage, many of you in the audience. Um, we have year-round programming with adults, schools across Long Island, and our Han family. Um, I'd like to highlight an exhibition that's opening next week in our lobby that um, is co-curated by Dr. Georgette Greer-Key of the Eastville Community Historical Society, and Michael Butler, an artist and Sag Harbor resident, um, entitled Afrofuturism. It will feature the work of four artists and artifacts from the collection of the Eastville Community Historical Society. I look forward to seeing you all soon at Bay Street Theater. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. Four seconds under. Michael Lawrence, everybody. Okay. I'm Michael. I'm Michael Lawrence, uh, Executive Director of the Bridgehampton Chamber Music. Leonard Bernstein, uh, who's back in the news now because of that wonderful film of Bradley Cooper's Maestro, um, might have said it best. He said this about music. Music can name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. And Bridgehampton Chamber Music has, for the last 40 years, been working hard to do just that. 40 years, not quite 90, but a little more than the 33 back there. Um, <laughs> bringing together the world's finest chamber musicians to breathe life into musical works spanning hundreds of years of composition. It all started back in 1984 when our founder and artistic director, Maria Martin, who's also here with us tonight. Mm. Hey, Maria. Oh, wow. Yeah. Along with her husband, Ken Davidson, launched a small festival with two concerts over a single weekend, with tickets being sold off their front porch. Um, since then, Bridgehampton Chair Music has expanded into a five-week summer festival, a three-concert fall series, and a three-concert spring series, providing Long Island's East End with unique programs heard nowhere else, performed by some of the world's finest musicians. Mm. Maria has long been been recognized as not only one of the world's great flutists, but also as a pioneering programmer, creating concert experiences that combine well-loved canonical works with little-known gems from the past, as well as contemporary works. Our programs are often thematic, placing the music in historical context or um, reflecting the world we live in today. In addition, Mari and Bridgeham Chair Music have made major contributions to chair music through the creation of new works, commissioning over 35 pieces many of which become well-known around the world. In fact, we currently are uh, working on four new commissions that will be presented this summer, 2025 and 2026. Wow. Um, while we reach thousands of music lovers with our live concerts each season, because what we do here is too good not to share, we also launched an in-house recording label in 2012 and have released nearly a dozen recordings, including many of the commissions I mentioned. In addition, we videotape and record our live performances which reach hundreds of thousands of people through our YouTube channel each year. We're really proud to be a part of the Han Group. Um, we're so happy to be here. Unlike many of our colleagues, we don't have bricks and mortar, so we rely on other institutions, and uh, we've been incredibly lucky to have our home at the Bridgehampton Presbyterian Church. And I see many faces here that I recognize who've come to our concerts. It's a wonderful acoustical space. But uh, we're also happy to have partnered with uh, the Parish Art Museum and with Madhu and um, look forward to working closely with all of you going forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Ashley Klimmer. I'm the Director of Visitor Experience for DIA Art Foundation, which is a constellation of three rotating exhibition spaces and nine art sites located throughout New York, New Mexico, Utah, and Germany. We were founded in New York City in 1974 to help artists achieve visionary projects that might not otherwise be realized due to the scale and scope. I'm here tonight representing Dia Bridgehampton, also known as the Dan Flavin Art Institute, which many of you may know it as that. It was established by Dia Art Foundation in 1983 and designed by artist Dan Flavin. He renovated a shingled firehouse, then church, where now nine of his works of fluorescent light are permanently displayed on the second floor. And then on the first floor, we present yearly rotating exhibitions by artists primarily residing or working on Long Island or works that are inspired by the history of the space and location. Currently, we have an exhibit by Tony Cox, which opened in June and will be on display until May 27. So if you all haven't been out there to see that, I hope you will. And then opening on the 21st of June will be a new commission by Liliana Porter. Um, we are open throughout the year on Friday through Sunday, 12 to 6, and admission is free. And I look forward to talking with you all more after this, if anyone wants more information. Thank you. Thank you. You got it, Steve? Can you hold it up so I can see my time? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm resetting you. I'm, I'm Steve Long. I'm the executive director of the East Hampton Historical Society. And uh, uh, you see some kids at 
Mulford Farm, actually uh, at Home Sweet Home, uh, right next door. I want to give a special shout out to our Director of Education, Stacy Myers, who makes the magic happen. She's the reason we have thousands of students who come to our five properties uh, that we preserve and interpret, including Clinton Academy, Mulford Farm, the Marine Museum, the Thomas and Mary Nemo Moran Home and Studio, and the Domini Shops Museum, and we have 20,000 artifacts that we're taking care of as well. Uh, my two sons are among the school kids that have accompanied uh, Stacy, and what they talk about is making art when they visit, and the historical perspective that they gain. If it's uh, if making paint using concretions, or weaving just like David Mulford did, who lived at Mulford Farm, or printmaking like Mary Nemo Moran. It's that art making that really inspires them. And when the East Hampton Historical Society was first founded in 1921, we really had two missions. One, we were going to collect the relics of our community, and we were going to exhibit the work of East Hampton artists, and we're still doing that today. Uh, if you go to the Marine Museum, we have historical objects and images juxtaposed with contemporary paintings, photographs, sculpture, and other artwork that explore ongoing relationship with the sea. One of many examples, uh, but I see so many artists here. I invite you to join us. We would love to have your help in providing historical perspective on so many of the issues that we face in East Hampton and across the East End today. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Um, timing, it was all amazing. I am speaking, thank you so much, Steve. You're all wonderful. Um, and I get to speak on behalf of another extraordinary human being who could not be here tonight, uh, Dr. Georgette Greer Key. Um, you can please sure, clap for her. She is the director of the Eastfield Community Historical Society, which is featured here. Uh, you can read on the screen, which I will read to you. The mission of the Eastfield Community Historical Society is to preserve historic buildings and research, collect and disseminate information about the history of the Eastfield area of Sag Harbor, Long Island, New York, County of Suffolk, State of New York one of the earliest known working class communities composed of African Americans, Native Americans, and European immigrants. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jackie LaFaro. Hello everyone, I'm Jackie LaFaro, the executive director of the Hamptons Dock Fest, and I recognize many people here who've come to the festival, thank you so much. We're in our 17th year, that's pretty hard to believe, when it started with four films in a half a day. And so now it's grown to a week and we have about 30 films. We screen at Bay Street Theater, which has been our original home, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the Bay, uh, the Sag Harbor Cinema, which is our new and wonderful state-of-the-art venue. We are one of the last festivals in the season which has its positives and it has its negatives, but primarily we think it's in a sweet spot because it's after Thanksgiving, after everybody wants to stop feeding people and saying goodbye to family <laughs> and be alone in a dark theater, which is wonderful. <laughs> and then it's right before the Christmas madness. Mm. So it's two weeks or a week for you, for you to take in wonderful stories uh, we have a large and growing documentary fan base. Many of you are here. And people who love the nonfiction form of great stories, as we do. So we do that in December, and that's our main thing. The minute the festival ends, we start planning for the next year. But we also do a spring program uh, that you may not know about. It's called Doc's Equinox. It's the prelude to Earth Day Week. It's an environmental uh, three-day series with films, receptions, book signings, keynote speakers, and we do it in conjunction with the Southampton Arts Center. Thank you, Christina. Mm. So that's really wonderful. 
We also try to make kids a little bit more media literate when we can with our Young Voices program, and that takes place during the festival, where we have about 300 kids come from the local middle and high schools and teach them what, do, we show them a really good short doc, and then we extract those ingredients into a small workshop. So that's always wonderful. So the festival is growing. Um, it gives everybody pleasure, as much pleasure as I sometimes get out of it mm -hmm. after sometimes. the end of it. Um, but I also want to say just a couple of words about Han, because Han is really extraordinary. You've got about 21 or 22 not-for-profit organizations here. All the executive directors, we all go through the same grief and joy. <laughs> and it's very nice to be able to share it with people. And um, it's a great resource. You know, during COVID, it was extraordinary uh, to share information. So I'm really happy to be part of it. And uh, it's good to see everybody in person. We haven't seen each other in about a couple of years. Thank you, Jackie. Yep. Speaking on behalf of the Hamptons International Film Festival's founder and board president, Tony Ross. Um, actually, yes. Yeah. Change so your here's, title. The, here's the thing yes. I am not an executive director of any organization, nor Correct. am I on Han. So um, uh, when it comes time for the QA, do not ask me about Han, but I am really grateful that it exists because it's an extraordinary time of collaboration, um, and we've, I think, really been needing this, so I have a lot of gratitude for that. Um, I am the founder of uh, the Hamptons International Film Festival, at least one of them, but, um, and I was the chair for the first five years, and I had no idea what I was doing, at, nor did anybody else <laughs> was on the board. Um, but the reason that we started the festival was um, for several reasons. One was our love of film. Uh, one was that we felt there was a niche that could be filled for, that gave filmmakers um, more access to um, their audiences, to uh, distribution in a, in a more low-key kind of environment than some of the other festivals were providing, but also as a business owner, my late husband and I felt that um, there needed to be ways to uh, lengthen the season uh, for many of us to survive out here. And so that was also one of the goals of the festival. Um, and so we worked very hard to engage the, the businesses in the community. So we're a not-for-profit. We started in um, 1992 and had the first festival in 93. Um, we uh, started with a five-day festival. This year we're going to be running from October 4th to 14th. It's our first time doing an 11-day festival um, spanning two weekends. And the success of the last two years um, showing films um, uh, weeknights um, has been really, um, it's been so gratifying that the theaters have been completely full. I'd just like to also say, because I'm not an executive director anywhere, everybody has notes except me. <laughs> so sorry, you don't have notes? Okay, good. Um, You're doing great, Tony. Okay. And, okay. and if in, in, in doubt, you have 40 seconds left. So. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, we work uh, very closely with a lot of schools out here um, doing uh, film classes with them. We've given out um, over $500,000 worth of awards, tuition, um, prizes to filmmakers. We have a resolution, a conflict and resolution section that I am particularly proud of, as well as our documentary um, section. And um, I'm sure there's a lot more to say, but... That's great. You can, that's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Speaking on behalf of Ma's House, we have Ma's House founder and co founder and lead artist Jeremy Dennis. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just testing the mic. <laughs> uh, my name's uh, Jeremy Dennis. I'm the lead artist of Ma's House and BIPOC Art Studio on the uh, Shinnecock Indian Reservation in Southampton, New York. Uh, we are a new member to HAN, uh, we're also a new organization. So we formed in August uh, 2021, and we're a, a communal art space. So we have a year-round residency program for artists of color. We have um, all year-round exhibits that are open by appointment. We also have weekly workshops all year-round as well, uh, usually Fridays, um, 6 to 9 p.m. So in fact, even tonight, uh, my mom, Denise Silva-Dennis, is facilitating that. We have a great group that comes every week. 
Um, even though we primarily support artists of color, it's always open to the public, whether it's the opening receptions, um, the workshops, um, they're always multidisciplinary as well. And we do um, love working with other art nonprofits as well. So um, one example is we have um, about 14 artists per year who come through and stay at Ma's house and are inspired by the land, the uh, history of Shinnecock, um, just some of the current day issues. And so we always open it up by open call. And um, because of the space and limitations, it's about 14 artists per year. But we're always looking for other uh, spaces who might have vacancy to host artists. We ask them to do a, a public performance, workshop, or a type of meet the artist type of thing. So we do that, we do satellite exhibits, um, all kinds of different um, public performances like that. So we're really um, new and just um, hitting the ground running. Um, I also wanna highlight that I'm here with uh, Brianna Hernandez, who's our uh, director of curation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> Mr. Alejandro Sarlugi from uh, Madu Conservancy. Hi, I'm Alejandro Sarlugi, the director of the Madu Conservancy, and that's Yay. us right there. Um, but also, if you look over, if most of you look over your left shoulder, that is also us. Um, there is a print here where we're honored um, to lend um, a piece by Robert Dash to this wonderful print exhibition that Sam did. Um, so big congrats to Sam. Um, Madhu is a funny place. Um, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year as a public garden, um, yet it started when Robert Dash um, was driving around um, Sagaponic in 1967 with um, his realtor and he saw this land and the realtor was like, oh, you don't want to see that. And Bob said, oh, yes, I do. And he went there and they walked in and he said, it winked at me. And that first day that he saw it, which was actually probably about a year earlier, um, there was still a cow in the barn. Now, about eight years ago, we did a $1.2 million um, historic restoration of the barn and the rest of the house, summer house, and we show um, contemporary art. Hi. You get 10 seconds. Me again. Um, so we show, we show, I was saying we show, we have three contemporary art shows a summer. We have had films with the film festival there. We have had concerts with um, the Chamber Music Festival. Uh, we, it's, Han has been a wonderful, wonderful partner for us um, in terms of communicating with this, other, this august group of, I think we're more than 21 or 22, aren't we? We're 23, 23 now. 23 now. Um, the, and with the this new, young Jeremy man is the as one of our most recent exactly. um, yeah. inductees. Anyhow, um, do come out to Madhu. We open April 15th, um, and we'll be having our summer benefit June 15th, which is Much Ado About Madhu, with a new edition, which is um, Garden Rooms um, by four local um, interior designers doing outdoor rooms in the garden which is going to be kind of exciting, um, something new for us. That sounds so cool. So thank you all very much. Thank and you. And hope to see you. Sounds great. Ms. Uh, uh, Monica Ramirez Montagut, the executive director of the Parish Art Museum. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you. I'll Hi, try Monica. to stick to the two minutes. Mm -hmm. My name is Monica. I've had the privilege of uh, serving as a direct executive director of the parish for a year and a half. The parish is an institution that is 125 years old. It started in the Southampton Village, which is now uh, the Southampton Arts Center, run by Christina very deftly. Thank you, Christina. Um, the parish moved to Watermill some 10, 12 years ago. We have a campus that is about 35,000 square feet of a fantastic building designed by the Swiss architecture firm Herzog and de Muren. We have a very robust and deep collection of 3,600 objects valued in about $140 million. And it's a collection basically of artists of the East End and a lot of American art that 
uh, in our most recent mission statement, we will be engaging our collection, Artists of the East End, into a global context, into uh, global dialogues. We have also a theater and a coffee, and a cafe, and a fabulous store. In our theater, we show films, theater, um, films, chamber music, jazz. We partner with a lot of the colleagues at Han. Um, we serve between 45,000 and 65,000 people every year. We have a very robust education program. Most recently, we received a grant from the federal government to work with individuals with special needs um, and, uh, and to create a model for other organizations to look at what we're doing and serve between 1,500 and 2,500 folks. Um, in terms of Han, I'm delighted that uh, I came in this, into this position at the tail end of COVID and to have this fantastic network of colleagues to uh, hit the ground running. Uh, living here in the East End is a, is a different set of rules and my <laughs> colleagues here were very great, graceful in, in helping me navigate. And in terms of us coming together, I think uh, there's a possibility that we will all come together to celebrate the United States 250th anniversary in 2026. It's something that we've been loosely discussing and, uh, and this is a perfect setting for us to come together and be able to have this critical mass of knowledge, expertise and present from our own perspectives, uh, our own contributions to American history and to America. And so, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Speaking on behalf of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, okay, the, I, I, uh, I, Helen I'm Harrison. Live. Thank you. Um, the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center is a national historic landmark and a founding member of Han and also of the National Trust Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program. And it's located in Springs, about four miles north of East Hampton Village and it's the former home and studio of abstract expressionist painters Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, who lived and worked there from late 1945 until their deaths, he in 1956 and she in 1984. Now in her will, Lee uh, instructed her estate to deed the property to a nonprofit that would run it as a quote unquote public museum and library. And it was the Stony Brook Foundation a nonprofit affiliate of Stony Brook University that agreed to take it and develop it according to Lee's wishes. They accepted the deed in 1987 and opened the property to the public in 1988. And it comprises a roughly acre and a half uh, site with five buildings. You've got the main house. Oh, is my pointer not working? Well, I guess you can guess which one is the main house. <laughs> A, a garage that now serves, and that's kind of hidden by the tree there, uh, serves as the public uh, restroom and office. Uh, we also have the storage building, the little white building there that serves as our museum store, and an outhouse. Ah, there you go. Oh, thank you very much. The outhouse at the back there behind the white building. It's no longer operable. No, that's not the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have the artist studio which is um, the shingled building with the sloping roof over there. Now, the studio is our primary exhibit, and what it shows is evidence of both artists' gestural painting techniques on the walls and floor. Visitors can see where specific paintings were made, and a virtual reality experience returns certain works to the places of origin. So we offer the guided and VR tours uh, by reservation from Thursdays through Sundays in May through October. And we also present exhibitions, lectures, and on-site school and family programs, as well as a year-round series of Zoom talks and workshops. We also have a separate study center at the Stony Brook Southampton campus. That includes a 5,000 volume art reference library that's open to the public during library hours and archives that are available for research by appointment. So we have a very well-rounded program, not only in the summer, but year-round. Last year, we welcomed about 11,000 visitors. And now, I'm delighted to welcome and to introduce our new Eugene, Thaw and, Eugene V. and Claire E. Thaw director, Matthew Ward. Please stand up, Matthew. His first day on site was today. <laughs> <laughs> and
and he's going to lead the Paula Krasner House and Study Center into an exciting new phase of development. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Genevieve Philafleur from the Sag Harbor Cinema. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Sherry said, I'm the executive director of Sag Harbor Cinema Arts Center. Um, the historical and iconic landmark building just a half a block away um, on 90 Main Street um, has been a place for entertainment for almost 100 years, actually maybe over 100 years. It was originally, it became a theater in 1915 um, with vaudeville and talkies, and then in the 1930s it was actually demolished and then rebuilt and renovated um, by the famed theater designer John Everson. Um, then, as most of you know, um, in 2016, the building was gutted by a fire, uh, but brought back to life by so many of you here. Um, your support, your resilience, your vision has once again brought Sag Harbor Cinema to life. And now as a three-story, three state-of-the-art um, theater uh, art center, we continue to create a living space uh, that pays homage to the art of film. It allows us to gather and experience those movies together and provide a forum and discussion for those works, whether it's a Q&A after a film or a chat upstairs in the cinema's green room. Um, along with my passionate colleagues at the cinema, among them Julia Daniolo Vajan, who is the American Films Programmer for the Venice Film Festival, and Sarah Myers, who is our technical director, uh, who came from the Museum of Modern Art, we bring the best films to the East End, we show them in the very best way possible, and we do it every day of the year. Thank you, Genevieve. Wait, I have a little bit more. Okay, well, you're over, okay, you're, okay, you're okay, over time. Just, can you make it quick? Right. Thank you. Anyway, it's been an honor and a privilege to steward this organization for the last two and a half years. Um, we're moving into our third year of continuous programming, bringing festivals to the East End, including our own signature um, Festival of Film Preservation, which is um, going to be in its fourth year in November. And we're going to bring even more industry professionals and insiders to talk about the craft of film restoration. Uh, also, part of our core mission, we continue to bring the best new films, retrospectives, special events, special guests um, to share their insights with you, our audiences. And we recently hired a new director of education who will enhance our mission by creating a pilot student workshop this summer, as well as organize, continue to organize our free projection series with other nonprofits here on the East End. Um, last year, we had over 66,000 filmgoers come through our doors. Wow. Um, so we hope, you know, you see that the cinema is a positive impact on the community, helping to bring entertainment, jobs, a place to gather, and we think the best popcorn on the East End. Nice. Anyway, Thank you, Genevieve. <laughs> Next, I am speaking on behalf of another fabulous person who is unfortunately not here tonight, pictured on the screen. Hope somebody can tell Brenda Simmons, uh, the founder of the Southampton African American Museum, Sam, um, how warmly her name was received when her picture came on the screen. Um, Brenda shared with us this message. To pro Southampton uh, African American Art Museum to promote an understanding and appreciation of African American culture by creating programs that will preserve the past, encourage learning, and enhance the life of the community. Sam will research and collect local history, produce media events, create exhibitions and community celebrations, treasuring the past, tending to the present, and transforming the future. She gave me speaking notes on how to say that. <laughs> As founder and executive director of the Southampton African American Museum, it's been a pleasure being a part of Han. The support and collaboration has been beneficial to us all, enabling Han to increase the visibility and importance of the arts here on the East End and beyond. Thank you, Brenda. Southampton Arts Center, Ms. Christina Moazari Stra uh, Strasfield. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Southampton Art Center, situated at 25 Jobs Lane in the heart of Southampton Village, on three and a half acres of beautiful parkland, formerly the, Str the Parish Art Museum. <laughs> uh, we are open year-round and proud to say we celebrated our 10th anniversary this summer. Our mission statement at the Southampton Art Center is building community through the arts. We have four galleries, a multi-use theater auditorium, an art studio, studio, an outdoor summer stage, and a sculpture garden. We present and produce inspiring, inclusive, socially and regionally, regionally relevant programs across all disciplines, visual arts, theater, music, film, literature, dance, and wellness. We welcome connecting and collaborating with the diverse members of New York's East End community and beyond. Influenced by the rich cultural tradition and artistic history of our region, the Southampton Arts Center drives cultural en engagement and economic vitality to Southampton and the East End. We have distinguished ourselves as a destination for multi-generational audiences to art artistic, educational, and transformational experiences. Using the arts as a unifier, we provide a platform for the many voices who comprise our region creating mutual understanding and effective positive dialogue, collaboration, and professional opportunities for growth. We do, f this, we do this through a robust schedule of activities, including four major exhibitions and yearly outdoor sculpture installations. Last year, we featured 156 visual artists. We had 21 live performances in the theater, 225 films, panels, talks, and book signings. We host classes for adults and children, and we've worked collaboratively with 108 program partners, proudly wow. having brought 50,000 plus visitors to Southampton Art Center to celebrate and enjoy the arts. Um, we are going to be having a, an exhibition uh, called Look at the Book, opening February 24th, which a number of the artists are in the, gal are in the galleries here today that are in that exhibition. We also collaborate with Hamptons Jazz Fest, Doc Fest, Hamptons International Film Festival, and we are so excited. Um, art enhances your life, and we really encourage you to all come to all of our organizations and really celebrate the arts together. Thank you, Christina. Here, here. Uh, Kristen, speaking on behalf of the Southampton Cultural Center. The Southampton Cultural Center is also located in the heart of the village of Southampton. We are overlooking Agawam Park and we are looking forward to celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. I'm Kirsten Lonny, and I'm blessed to have been there since day one. Wow. First as a founding member, then as a member of the board, and as executive director for the last 20 years. <clears throat> if you look at the image of the cultural center, what you see on the right is what we call the Levita Center for the Arts, because that has been made possible by a generous bequest of the late Willard and Aura Levitas. The Levita Center for the Art features an auditorium that seats 160, a gallery space, and on the other side of the building, what also is Veterans Hall, we have a dance studio, a state-of-the-art TV studio, and several classrooms. Our year-round programming features live performances that include full theater, perform theater productions, a comedy club, film screenings, and contemporary and classical concerts and recitals, and dance performances. We are also the host of the popular Concerts in the Park series that takes place every summer in Agawam Park and on Cooper's Beach. The gallery features year-round exhibitions that promote local and regional artists. On the educational sides, <coughs> we offer classes and workshops in art, acting, dance, and music, and we offer about 20 to 25 classes every week, seven days a week, serving 250 students on average. All over, every year, we welcome about 35 to 40,000 visitors to all of our programs. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Kirsten. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of the church, is yours truly. I'm Sherry Pascarella. I have been the executive director of the church for almost one and a half years. Uh, the church, where you are all presently seated, um, was founded, opened its doors in April 2021 as a multi multidiscipline art community and artist residency center. Our mission is to foster creativity on the east end of Long Island and to celebrate the history of Sag Harbor as a maker's village. Over the past year, we have presented more than 
340 artists across our many programs. In 2023, that included three exhibitions, uh, 124 events and educational programs, and our residents. 66% of our residents are uh, artists of color or uh, queer identified. In addition, our exhibition program, I'm grotesquely under time, so I'm just gonna talk. Um, our exhibition program consists of three, two to three exhibitions a year of visual art uh, that embraces with the goal of making art accessible, contemporary art accessible, bringing globally relevant art trends around the world and showing and embracing artists from our own region with equanimity. In addition, we do one exhibition a year of material culture, meaning objects from everyday life as they uh, exist as forms that are familiar but are also artful and creative. You've seen the bicycle, for example. You've seen the guitar as another example. Uh, coming up, you will see this summer an exhibition curated by our chief curator, Sara Cochran, on the topic of humor in contemporary art composed of only female artists, which is very exciting. Um, we uh, welcome you to engage in any of our programs. We are open year round, five days a week. Uh, with extended summer hours run by an exemplary and yet very small team. Thank you for being at the church. And thank you again to our co-founders, April Gornick and Eric Fischel, whose vision the church is a manifestation of. Thank you, guys. Uh, speaking on behalf of the Watermill Center, we have Elite RJ. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you to the church for hosting Han tonight. Uh, my name is Elise Herget. I'm the managing director of the Watermill Center. Um, the Watermill Center is a laboratory for the arts and humanities. We were founded in 1992 by the theater and opera director Robert Wilson. Um, Watermill began as a space where Wilson brought together his collaborators, international artist friends to um, live, work, and create together, mostly over the summer. Um, it's, we started with you know, a summer residency of 15 to 20 artists, and over time have grown to host hundreds of artists annually um, at the Watermill Center. Um, and we've grown into an incubator and a stage for the next generation um, of artists and thinkers. At Watermill, we're committed to providing multidisciplinary and international artists with a space to work, the tools to create, and a platform to exchange ideas. Um, we are project and process based, which means we shift and evolve to reflect the work and interests of the artists um, who take up residence at Watermill. Um, we're a space for experimentation, a space for production, and sometimes we're a space for presentation but most often, uh, presentation takes the form of partnership for us. Mm -hmm. And that's really where Han is an invaluable network and one of the many um, invaluable um, partners and groups of people that we work with often. Uh, we've partnered, you know, a couple examples, we've partnered with Guildhall to present Catherine Galasso, we've partnered with the Parish Art Museum to present Tomashi Jackson and Four Freedoms among many others. Um, and it really is a beautiful eco ecosystem that we find ourselves within. Um, the collaboration is truly um, incredible and each organization really does make the other stronger. Um, Watermill invites the community here to meet the artists during open studios. Our next one is on February 16th. Um, and to schedule a tour to come and see the building and to see the collection. Uh, we are home to Robert Wilson's 10,000-piece uh, collection of art and objects from all different periods and cultures um, and mediums. And there's also a 10,000-volume library that is open by appointment, and I welcome everybody to come visit it because it is an absolute gem that I walk through every day, and I wish I could stop there every morning to read a book. Um, the grounds are always open. We have a 10 acre property um, and we host um, our community for education programs and um, have an annual community day as well in the fall. Um, so I invite you to come by and I pass Thank on. Thank you. To Julie, passing along. Thank you, at least to Julianne Pence Boone, who from the West Hampton Performing Arts Center. 
Hi everyone, I'm Julianne. I'm the Executive Director at the West Hampton Beach Performing Arts Center. I've been running the organization for the last five years, but I've been with the organization for 15, um, previously running the education programs. Um, so the West Hampton Beach Performing Arts Center is a 425 seat jewel box of a theater nestled on Main Street, right in the heart of West Hampton Beach Village. And there's really kind of three components to what we do. The first is our very popular main stage program where we present marquee artists in both music and comedy, um, sometimes dance. And that runs all year round. We also have an arts education program. Our school day performance series uh, brings in about 10,000 students each year from as far east as Montauk, as far west as Nassau County. We also have an arts academy uh, we run in-house where we're producing full-scale musicals on our stage. Um, we do a program for students with special needs and their caregivers called Upbeat. Um, we have a daytime program for seniors called Melodies and Memories, uh, which is very special where um, seniors come and they they reminisce, they learn music singing skills, and then we put it all together with their memories to create something really special for the community. Uh, so we have about 600 students that participate in those programs on site year round. Um, we also have a finest in world cinema program where we screen first run films from around the world, independent documentary films that we're very proud of. We bring in about oh, 30,000 uh, patrons to our performances um, each year, and yeah, that's about it. Fabulous. Thank you. So these are an amazing group of people. Um, now that you now you now you know them all, you can show up and, and get to know them better. Um, let's open it up for questions. I'm always happy to ask questions if we need to get the ball rolling. But does anybody have a burning question? That Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Yeah, th uh, this is uh, extraordinary, and uh, um, it made me feel uh, so proud to be a part of this community. And uh, yeah, as, <laughs> as, as I was uh, listening to every area of culture that is covered by the people here, I was thinking, where else does this possibly happen on a scale that's manageable, you know? It's, it, this is like big city stuff. <laughs> and it's, yet it's so specific. And, and I was wondering, um, well, first of all, uh, uh, an observation, which is that a, a lion's share of the organizations were started by artists out here. That seems like a unique uh, it's really uh, interesting kind point. of uh, impetus and, and DNA for this area. Uh, and I was wondering, as everyone was talking, it, and I, I'm sure you discussed it, but I'd love to hear, mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about trying to form an umbrella that runs all of it out of its organization as opposed to, uh, you know, meetings, et cetera, but actually almost like a university structure or something else where it's schools of or whatever that mm -hmm. might actually help shape some of the overlaps in terms of uh, um, uh, arts that are being um, uh, shown or, or done out here, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great question. Well, coming from a university structure, I don't recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Um, well, you know, if you want to think about bureaucracy, you definitely want Stony Brook as a model. Uh, <laughs> lovely people, believe me, but uh, it, can, it can bog you down. And I, one of the beauties of Han, and you know, we've collaborated with Guild Hall, we've collaborated with many of the other, with Duck Creek, many of the other arts organizations, and the ad hoc nature of it is kind of the point that you could just pick up the phone and say, uh, you know, uh, can, can I use your theater? Could I use your barn? Uh, would you like to use my place? We have a lot of interaction that's very informal. And I think there's a real value in that. We had talked about forming a 501c3 and making it, you know, getting bylaws and all that nonsense. And then we said, screw it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Helen.
I, I want to, um, one person I think uh, who has, in this short time that I've been there, which is so amazingly well answered by Helen, in the short time that I've been there, um, one of the things that I've observed um, is the tremendous resources of, that Monica um, uh, Ramirez uh, Montagut, who from Parish has been bringing with her to the table. Monica is involved with a lot of organization, national organizations outside of the Hamptons um, and has been um, working to help make some of her resources available to those of us in here. And she mentioned the 250th um, anniversary program. Um, I, do you want to speak a little bit about how that could work for all of us? Yeah, a little disclaimer, I started my career in New York City with a foundation that was doing this umbrella city-wide festival, so I learned a lot there. It was called the Mexico Now Festival. And uh, then when I lived in San Jose, uh, anyway, I've, I've tried to do this kind of like umbrella festivals. And the point is, I, I have to say that it is really remarkable that 22 executive directors pull an hour every month to get together. We are so overworked, understaffed, and you know, that, it, that I commend us all for making that effort, right? And so uh, it's difficult for us with the limited resources that we have and coming out of COVID to take on building a new structure that would add to our workloads. However, since we're already getting together, the idea is like, can we deploy this time that if during COVID it helped us to, to heal, to come together, to share resources? Can we turn it into a little bit more of a working session, uh, if we can? So the idea is that with the same time that we're investing, with the same resource that, that we all have, can we just coordinate and whatever we were going to be doing individually for the United States 250th anniversary, can we coordinate and have things happen in a span of two weeks? And can we start applying for grants as a critical mass of cultural uh, leaders in this mm -hmm. field contribute that way. So that could be a pilot that is well within our capacity and that can tell us whether we have this critical mass that can bring more resources to us. Uh, it, uh, we have a committee created for that and, and see if we can manage. But I think it's an issue of making sure that whatever we do together is within the capacities of organizations. Mm -hmm. That is something that we're already doing, that it just means that we can send two or three more emails and coordinate. We do that with our galas, we do that with important programs, uh, which is very important for all of us to, to stagger. Can we do something else similarly programmatically? And if that renders excellent resorts, then we can formalize it a little bit more. But right now, I think it's just a way to self-organize when we're all kind of like stretch, you know, stretched out. Stretched thin. Did, that, did that answer your question? Did I? Yeah, I yeah. think it did. One thing I, yeah, thank you. You can clap for that. I think um, it would be interesting. Michael, I think you were, uh, were you on the committee uh, for the Southampton? Um, I, I thought you were for the Southampton uh, repeal of the permitting. Right. Yes. Okay, so let me explain right. that Han has committees. Who started the committee system? Okay, so there are subcommittees and you can volunteer to be on them, just like being on a board basically. Um, and one of the subcommittees that was formed over the past year that had tremendous success um, actually was with regards to town permitting. And what was the name of the committee? Michael was on the committee. I think Jackie you were on the committee too? Yeah, permit hell. Is that what we call yeah, it? Yeah, permit, permit hell. hell. So explain the scenario and explain the outcome because it was in one year. I was shocked to see in one year how the collective agency of this shadow organization was actually able to repeal uh, to get a town, Southampton, to change its laws in order in favor of the cultural organization. So well, talk us to does that. Does anybody remember a band named Chainsmokers? I think. Yeah. 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 Do anybody remember an event that happened yeah. out here a few years ago? <laughs> Yeah, well, that event um, caused some changes at City Hall in terms of the way they wanted to do permitting, which had a trickle-down effect on some of the smaller arts organizations, um, including some of those on the stage. And what that meant was that there was a, um, a change in the, 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 the laws uh, at the uh, town level, um, which caused uh, some misunderstandings, I think, at the, uh, at the permitting 
in the permitting process. And it created some real undue burdens on a lot of our organizations. And so we all worked together um, to discuss how we might approach that. And we uh, engaged some people on the town council and we worked together with them. We set up meetings. Um, and over the course of a year, we helped them uh, redesign the language within the town code. Um, and we were able to actually get that passed just uh, this just this past July, yeah, and it was uh, it was incredible. I, I don't think it would have happened without this group, and so it, that's one of the things that's really amazing. Really remarkable. Any more questions from? Oh, hi, Almond. I don't know how we're going to get you a mic. Do you want to yell? Who want to answer that? That's a good question. Chris, did you, were you going to say something? Um, I was well, just going to add one word to that, which, brilliant question. And then in the next word I would say is housing. Yeah. But, yeah, so I'm going to let, defer now to me. I'm going to yeah. yield my time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we do, we have probably every other month we have a visitor who, who is an elected official. And we bring lots of things to the table, How affordable housing, we've discussed. We ha actually, I don't think we have discussed transportation, but that's a great one mm -hmm. because I think there are four trains a day between New York City and this area. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, they skip all the working towns, mm -hmm. like the towns where my family lives, <laughs> passed over. And, um, and so anything that you think of like that, that you want us to talk about using our collective bargaining power? Like, let us know. Mm -hmm. That's okay. a great answer. Agenda. She's adding it to the agenda. Yeah. I mean, I, like in terms of, uh, there are things that we've talked about in ter that people are currently working on in terms of collective bargaining. One of them is museum services, things like shipping and transportation and installation services for all of us, which because of all of the expenses incurred with being out here, the costs of which are, are going up very rapidly. Um, more questions, hi. Hello, <clears throat> this is just to add a little plug for poetry. <laughs> um, at the Madhu entrance, I at one point was lucky enough to be there and see Robert Dash sitting there in a chair as people came in. And I noticed next to him there was a little box and it said Poet poetry welcome. And they had a little pad and pencil and you could write a poem. So I, I wrote a poem about Robert and I don't know if he ever saw it. I expected he would have called me right away to thank me very much. <laughs> but he, I didn't hear from him. Anyway. I'd like to put in a plug with your collective power and influence. We have you all here. Is there any way we could get that box up and running again? Uh, we, can, we can certainly get that box up and running again. Um, <laughs> poetry is a big piece of, of Madhu's history. Um, it's not something that really is part of my world, to be completely honest with everybody here. Um, but it's not something that we're ignoring, and we have um, had different um, programs at Madhu. Last summer, we had um, Silas and Rashawn 
dancers who had had a residency at the Watermill Center. Um, they performed at Madhu and they had a poet reading Bob's words in a sort of a riff, um, just as background to the dance performance and the saxophonist that was there. Really extraordinary program. This summer we have Trisha Brown um, coming in July 20th, I think, and there is a poetry aspect to that program as well. So we're trying to bring back poetry to Madhu. Um, it, just to your point, and I don't know how many people know about the history at Madhu, but um, there was a, a sort of a salon at Madhu, and Bob's friends would come and write poetry about Madhu or about their life or whatever was going on. And Bob had this incredible archive of these manuscripts. And the Beinecke Library at Yale acquired them um, about 10 years ago now um, from Bob when he was still alive. So, and the Beinecke, you know, really works their collections. So it, it's that sort of continuing to live in a very different way, um, not, not necessarily just at Madhu, but now it's grown into a much bigger thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much Carrie, for bringing that you. up. Yeah, Carrie, sure. 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 Yeah, there it's on, it's on, oh, right? Do we have a question? Oh, Satha, hi. Uh, Carrie, did you want to go and then Satha can ask her Yeah, that's just great. I, I, want it, you, I want you to come and make a wish on our Yoko Ono tree. We have a Yoko Ono wish tree and um, a sim similar tree will be at Tate Modern in the Turbine Hall this year, but that's another form of, of poetry. And I'm inspired by what all of you at the church are here doing um, with open studios where artists can come and make their work. Mm -hmm. And I think what one of the things that we'll be looking to do at Longhouse this summer is sort of writing workshops, just come and sit, drink coffee, write. It feels like a place where Jack was an author, it feels like a place. So you could do poetry at Madhu, you can write and the Yoko Ono wish tree. I want to just say one more thing, and this will be the last thing I say, almost to Amon's point. Um, I want to thank you all for coming so much, and I want all of you to find us interns. Most of us, no, most of us have internship programs, and because of the housing and the, and the transportation, That's very true. we don't get enough applications, and so they're open. Esperanza, Leon and I the other day had a great conversation with a woman from the Shinnecock Nation, and I said, you gotta have kids that need scholarships. And she said, what scholarships? Mm -hmm. So scholarships, internships, for kids who are out here, mm -hmm. I mean, we've all got them, right? Yeah. So we, please we have a, do us a favor an and do us, do us a favor program. and uh, they're up people. on websites and, and they pay, Yeah, and they pay. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, for that plug. That's a really good one. We do need interns. We have a question up here Hi. from Seth Lowe. Hi, Hi Seth. Uh, yeah, this is really incredible and I'm totally inspired. But as always is the case, I was kind of questioning, so who's not here? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I was thinking about is the role of Ashwag Hall and the Springs Improvement Society, which is not considered maybe necessarily an art society, and yet is part, part of this. And um, I was trying to think more broadly about all the spaces that we use, not just the ones that, that are, are organized in a formal way. The other piece of it that I was thinking about and that made me resonate to the poetry and the writing piece that we've come to is thinking about our libraries as being part of this network in some, some way. Mm -hmm. um, since our libraries have really, I think, probably made great commitments to the written word and um, trying to sustain us in other ways. So um, th I'm overwhelmed by the richness, but I also mm -hmm. wanted to extend an arm out that we even have more than we see sitting here. Well, and, it is true. You know. And part of thank you for that, for, for saying that, because there's a lot of wonderful work being done by people in this organization that aren't here. And um, there are some minor selection criteria for Han, Andrea, do you want to explain those? Elka. You look, oh, 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 or Amy, or Elka, whoever. Um, yeah, so we decided it, at inception that there would be membership requirements, they're minimal. You have to be a 501c3 in order to join. We are not as a group, but you have to be to be in the organization. Um, you have to have been um, in existence for a minimum of, I think it's two or three years pr prior to even applying, and people can apply and do 
to become members, as we, and we review those and decide as a, as a group whether or not it fits the cr criteria. The other is that you need to be able to have some open to the public exhibitions at least once throughout the year. Um, and, and make them available to the people of the East End of Long Island. So, so it's really minimal, and people can apply, and they generally do it at our website. Um, we used to have a form on it, I don't know if we still do, and people can apply, and then we review those. What? There's now a contact us. There's now a contact us, there you go. I'm not sure where it goes, but there is. <laughs> we'll add that to our website, which we had to just redo because we we had some issues with our, our uh, host. Um, but I just did, I did want to say, just as someone who has, has been with this group since the beginning as well, back when I was at Southampton Arts Center, and now I, I got to stay as part of Guild Hall because I, I help a lot, I guess. But anyway, um, it is really, I have to say, like the most incredible group of people. And um, before Han, there, as Andrea said, I think there really was no communication. Not only was there not communication, there was competition. And, um, and, and suspicion, yes, Elka, thank you. I'm still a little bit with the two of us, but we'll get over it. Anyway, um, but no, but it's, it's incredibly, it's the transformation in the region among the arts organizations has been so incredible with this group that Andrea and Elka and Terry first created. And um, yeah, I just, one of our big things is that we're trying also to remind or tell people that this area is not just about sun and fun and parties and beach, but also, that's the Barbie reference, um, uh, but also this incredibly thriving arts community that rivals or exceeds places like Hudson, Beacon, all of that. So we, it's, it's something that we're still trying very hard to do to have a sort of um, almost like a marketing campaign to, to tell people how vibrant of an arts community this region is. So we love your recommendations on how we might make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. We have a question, Ava, back there? Hi. She had her horned up strong. Sorry. What did I miss? <laughs> Talina's following you with a mic, so if you could stand still for five seconds. Uh-oh. Was the incredible network formed, and I'm very grateful to have inherited the role of coordinating the education and programming subcommittee. So I, once a month, get to meet with members of the network whose roles serve in either and education and public programs, and it's really very special, and um, there she is. We were talking about um, the word competition is, is gone and to work with educators and programming people and look to ways to collaborate and, and create programming that we share amongst one another, not just our calendars for our galas, which is in itself very which important. Which is useful, by the way. Yes, by all stretch. But um, we're able to talk about like, hey, we're doing something in this way. Mm -hmm how can we help each other and do trainings and things together. So I'm really grateful for the last two years. By the way, I work at the Watermill Center. I'm Ava. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ava. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to speak to that, um, the issue of collaboration, um, which has so drastically changed. Um, when we founded the festival now 30 years ago, um, I had in mind that we would do things year round, um, which we do do, but it was such a struggle. Like when I went to previous Guild Hall, they didn't want to screen films because that's not an art form. And uh, so it took like maybe six, seven, eight years to be able to do that. I was doing silent films and all this. We tried to do these outdoor screenings. We were working with schools and there was a lot of competition and I had to go individually to each one. And this is just like a game changer. This is totally a game changer that I think benefits everybody. And also, again, like the permitting and all of that has just changed the groundwork on w that we're, we're working in. And I think all of the towns are wanting us to be here because they see the, the benefit in that. So I really appreciate everything you do. Well said. Well said. Thank you, Tony. Well said.
we have a question over here? Somebody, Vlad, did you have a question? Oh, we do have in the back there. Oh, and right here. Monica? Hi. Dueling question. Okay. This is not so lofty, more logistical. But I was at an event at, um, at Guild Hall, actually, for Seth's book, and the conversation turned to um, community. And I guess there were some people there who were weekenders or new out here, and they said, God, wouldn't it be great if there was like a calendar online that had every, remember, that had er, like all the events of all these amazing organizations? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, I know it's like just a it's, logistical it is, thing. It, I mean, it is a logistical nightmare, I will say that. However, But there, you have this nice new website. Okay, <laughs> that's true. But can I plug something? And by the way, I mean, if, if anybody wanted to endow Han to provide services like this to you guys. We could do that. Uh, right, thank you. Because it's not cheap. Labor is not cheap, as you know. Um, but I will put a plug in for somebody who's not here, but an organization who does advocate for all of us, which is the Long Island Arts Alliance. Um, Lauren from that organization was going to be present tonight. She is not, unfortunately. However, the Long Island Arts Alliance, um, they do have a website where all of this is aggregated and few people out here, apparently uh, it's more popular elsewhere on Long Island. However, um, everybody here should use it. It's called Discover Long Island. And we post all of our events on it. I don't know how many of you guys here do, um, but it does actually drive quite a few people to us. Uh, so I would encourage when you're looking for that aggregate to check that out. It's a great resource. I will also put in a plug for, uh, we have robust culture, but we also have a really robust local press. Um, as you guys know, they deserve a round of applause if any of them are here. And um, the listings on 27 East and uh, East Hampton Star and South Hampton um, also are very, very useful. So. Uh, be sure if you're not already using that. But Discover Long Island is a good one. Any other questions? April. I was just wondering, um, Carrie actually made me think of this because you mentioned redwoods, how many redwoods are planted out here. I think the Tucker Martyr has at least one at his Folly Arboretum, and I was kind of hoping that that could, did I miss it? Folly Tree, Folly Tree, Folly Tree Arboretum, sorry. Um, that it would be lovely if, if he could be included. And do you have room for, my question is, do you have room for expanding and, and inviting other new you know, people to join you? Yeah, yeah people don't, first of all, uh, do you want, I don't know if you want to answer that or if you want me to. You can apply. We do invite people to apply, or I don't personally, these ladies do. Um, and also people have been suggested to apply and they haven't for whatever reason. Sometimes they feel overwhelmed with how much they have to do and can't quite make it to that. So um, yeah, Jeremy for years and he finally said yes. And then we all voted him in and here he is. But yeah, people, I think Tucker, Tucker I believe he's been asked, yeah. Um, so, if there are any other questions in the audience, oh, Nina Deck. I'm the hello, hello. I'm the former director of the Bridgehampton Museum, and I I feel like I'm in it's like a high school reunion of old friends. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, and I, I we were sort of a hybrid organization with regard to our connection to Han, and it was very loving this organization and the people in it to to me and to us. More a history museum, uh, which actually does have redwoods donated by martyrs to us. So um, that's sort of an interesting side fact. But uh, there is room for, I think, hybrid organizations like Steve Long and um, the East Hampton Historical Society and other organizations that uh, have different sort of uh, focuses in terms of what they're doing, but have art and the exploration and the exhibition of art as part of their tenant. And I think that's, that's the lovely part of it, which is that kind of robust dialogue that goes beyond just a narrow scope and reminds us that we're all connected in many different ways. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Nina, that's well said. <laughs> oh yeah, can, um, Selena, can, do you, can you flip us forward one? Uh, Amy was just asking, so you can see the names of all the organizations. Um, oh yeah, sorry, there are three organizations that are not here in addition to the one, the two, Brenda and Georgette. There's also um, Collins' organization, the, Bridgehampton, Histo 
Southampton Historic Society, the Bridgehampton Museum, of which Nina used to, was formerly the director, and uh, one more that I'm missing that's not here with us tonight. I think that's it, because I spoke about Brenda and Georgette. Eastville, I, I, I read them, I read her statement on her behalf. Yes, question? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. I remember that. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I remember that. It was independently organized, but yeah, it was amazing. Uh, John, did you have a question in the back? Is that your name? Bill. Bill. Hi, Bill. Bill, I'm sorry. John, I don't know. Sorry. Um, hey, you. my name is Bill with Peconic Pictures, and Thank also you. I help uh, Jess with community outreach in Springs. And it dawned on me that it's restaurant week and oh. <laughs> happening in Sac Harbor and on Long Island. And I, I was wondering if there's any stories or thoughts on just to further the ball with collaboration in terms of like sharing of memberships or if um, uh, things like, uh, you know, open, like, like more of the festivals that mm. could, could take place between everybody so that not just outside the community, but inside the community, you would hear about like a big mm. celebration of the arts through and then get to know everybody all at once, sort of like. I mean, it's a great idea to do a festival like even like this, but on a Sunday afternoon and everybody can have brunch or whatever. Um, I know that in terms of organized efforts, um, we, in Sag Harbor, uh, I had uh, brought this idea to uh, Genevieve and to Tracy about us uh, experimenting with that and launching some kind of culture pass in Sag Harbor, which, you know, hopefully will happen at some point. Um, we did a satellite, a smaller program of it where we, we extended reciprocal benefits between our staff, um, which, so, so for staff at the church at Sag Harbor, uh, cinema and Bay Street have uh, perks that make it easier for us to attend one of those programs. There is the inherent challenge when you're an arts worker that you often um, have so much of your own programming that you don't get the opportunity to see other people's programming so much. So that is really unfortunate. But you know, we are trying. And but I think what you're saying is a really great idea. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say that uh, in 2000. 18 or 17? I think 17 and 18. 2017 and 18, we actually did put together um, something called the Thaw Fest. I don't know if any of you remember that. Yeah, we that. did it for two years, did actually. Did it for two years, yes. Yeah. 2017, 2018. It was a, a weekend um, or a month at one point. We did... Uh, well, we did first, first we did a, it was a two or three day thing, and yep. then we did it over a period of a month on weekends. And we coordinated our programming, and we got buses and to take people from one event to another, and uh, there was an incredible amount of time and effort that was put into creating the Thaw Festival, the Hamptons Arts Weekend, I think is what we came up with the first time. Um, and, uh, you know, our events all did well, but I don't think it quite, it, it quite produced what we had been dreaming of. And we realized that the time that we spent together was being completely overtaken by the preparations for creating this festival. And so the things that had originally brought us together and sharing resources and just being able to talk about um, what's happening within each of our institutions and how we might help one another got waylaid by this uh, overarching festival. And so in the end, we decided maybe, maybe another time in the future, but um, then COVID hit and it didn't come, quite come back. Could, could, I, could I add to okay. Helen mentioned that the Paula Krasner House is a member of the Historic Artists Homes and Studios, which is a National Trust for Historic Preservation initiative. So is the East Hampton Historical Society's Thomas and Mary Nemo Moran Home and Studio. So is Longhouse. So is Madhu. So is Duck Creek. So is D'Amico uh, Institute. We have more historic artists homes and studios in 
East Hampton Town and Sagaponic than any township in all of America associated with, with this organization. So we had a really successful uh, collaboration last June where we basically said, let's, let's not make any more work for anybody else. Let's just do what we're doing, but we're just gonna create a postcard and market it together and see what kind of press we can get. And it was really successful kind of lifting us all up by having that, that kind of uh, way to communicate what we're doing. And well, it, it was just a regular old day to visit, but it was special because it was the Haas day to visit. And I think if maybe there was another way that there could be the Han day to visit, we're just doing the same old thing we always do, but it really would get us press, and that really moved the needle, at least I thought, for ha. The, the, Paula Krasner is always, and, and you, know, long, you guys are always like packed, but we really benefited by having the, uh, the additional marketing for the. Well, for you're going to be the, packed again because we have another group coming in April from well, the National true. Trust, yes. and that, that tour is sold out. So one of, the, one of the things about marketing is if you can market your, your destinations as part of a larger tour, where people also go to the wineries and they go to other events, maybe they even have a golf weekend and we sort of fold into that, that's where Discover Long Island could be helpful. And we need to get onto them as a group because they neglect the arts and they're more about recreation. So we really need to insert ourselves more and speak up uh, through Discover Long Island, which is basically the Chamber of Commerce for Long Island. Thank you, Helen. Oh, I just wanted to say that when we first opened the cinema, before you were there, Genevieve, but we made a special effort to reach out to the first responders who had helped save the building, what was left of it, and invited them for screenings. And um, I think some of the programming that we've been doing at the church too, like inviting people who work on Main Street to come after hours to see exhibitions and have someone there to talk to them about them. I'd really love it if everybody here could somehow focus on getting regular people that have regular jobs that don't have time, that need to squeeze in things like this to make our community, a community that does outreach to those people, to working parents, to like figure out some way of expanding this into other groups, not just people who think they like movies and that's it for the art, you know, absorption that they do in their lives, but like to make it somehow more available to people and more exciting to people to have like a, a free evening at an institution or whatever. And then the last thing is that it, I think this is like, Hannah's so great. I love everybody here. I'm so happy that it exists. And um, I've been to movies, uh, to some of the meetings too, when um, the cinema didn't have an executive director. So I was there and I just saw it in action and it's just spectacular. But I'm a little sad that there's no Hispanic representation in this network. <laughs> well, I, but I don't mean I don't mean people running, I mean like a Spanish speaking organization. I wish that there were and maybe there just isn't anything but well, there's Ola, but yeah. is Ola an arts organization? No, yeah. Arts. No, not really. That's the only one I can think of. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe we can maybe we can make more room for Ola programming too when they need it too, like all as a group. Yeah, I know we've done that. No, I think everybody does that. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Thanks, April. Um, thank you all. It was so informative. I'm just wondering if, uh, speaking of outreach, if there is a way to somehow partner or open the spaces that have the outdoor spaces with any of the animal rescue organizations. You know, talk about getting people to the community instead of going to like a Petco, if you could have a gimme shelter or an R for some smaller animal rescues, bring their animals to one of your gardens on a certain day and get people to come for an adoption event. I just thought it could be a good fit. We, we, we actually screened a film with a sack outdoors called Cat Daddies, and we had uh, Arf and their Adopt Mobile, 
and they didn't have any kittens, they only had the older cats, but nevertheless, it was enormously successful. We collected cat food, dog food, mostly cat food, because it was cat daddies, but mm -hmm. yes, we always look to partner with organizations that are subject, yes. yeah. Um, Are going to ARF and being able to adopt. Um, we also, this year, we're going to do more to welcome people who don't, we have people who came who didn't have a dog because dogs make them happy. And, or they're allergic, or they can't have a dog, or they travel too much. So, and we're going to rename the program Come, Sit, Stay. Nice, that's so cute. Very cute. Um, Sherry. Yes, sorry. The church did uh, the sketching of the animals event uh, last summer, so in which April did portraits of everybody who brought their dogs. So. <laughs> and Sabina Strita, who was here, also did that, and so did um, Lucy Winton. Hi, Sabina. Were you going to ask a question? Yes. Go for it. And then we're, I think we're going to wrap it up because it's 7:30, and everybody wants to go, and everybody's been an amazing audience. Uh, hi. Thank you for. We should get a photo of everybody. I have one question, it's a, it's a big one. Um, how are all the institutions doing with affordable housing for staff? It must mm -hmm. be really It's, um, I don't know who wants to, raise your hand if you want to talk about this. Andrea, do you want to talk about it? I mean, it, it is one of the biggest challenges on the East End, as you all know. It's something that threatens the future of all of the creative class out here. Um, having access to affordable housing and really what affordable housing means. Housing is out of reach for people from working class to professional class. Um, housing has become affordable primarily to people um, of high net worth. Um, and so it is something, there is an, a housing committee in Han. There have been conversations that have been had with municipalities. Um, it is, a, it is very challenging. Um, I, there's not much other than collective action. Andrea, did you want to speak to that a little bit? The person who has the most knowledge on this is Dr. Georgette Greer-Key. She's incredibly well informed on this subject. But I would say what we've done at Guildhall in the interim is we have, our staff is able to work from home up to three days a week. So if they do live far away, we would rather have them not suffer through traffic and commutes and have like a comfortable work day at home. So we've adopted some of the things we learned during the pandemic and made those permanent. That doesn't supply housing, but it does allow people who live farther away to work for Guildhall. Yeah, we've, we've also started using remote positions, especially for positions requiring expertise. Uh, Steve, I know you want to, uh, Chris wanted to say something. That's okay, a lot of people have called me Steve in my life. <laughs> it's funny, because somebody said to me at the beginning, you're good so name. good with names and faces, and I've got name, too it, messed Steve? up. Um, um, Chris Seifert. Over the last two years, we've been, uh, I, I've personally reached out to Stony Brook, Southampton, and we have been successful. This year will be, um, leasing two suites that they have in their dormitory environment. Um, it is a savings for us, not a huge savings in terms of what we normally have to pay for housing, which by the way, um, is 10 roughly 10% uh, of our annual budget. Um, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a concerted effort from on our part to try to find the partnerships. That actually is a great one with Stony Brook but it brings up the transportation issue of how do you get people from there to Bay Street. And this is for our workforce. Mm. So, it, and I think collectively, we've all um, talked a lot about affordable housing. Dr. George Greer Key is certainly very well informed about it. We've been in touch with uh, um, county and also um, state legislators about it. So we feel that, and we certainly are trying to advance whatever we can in terms of a voice about it. Mm -hmm. um, Alejandro, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, just, just quickly on that point, um, I was at a meeting yesterday in Town Hall in Southampton, and you know when, when this is the 
Is it working? Harry, can you? Yeah. Oh, Genevieve working. has one. Hey there. Um, I was in a meeting in Southampton Town Hall, and there's a developer that wants to build in Bridgehampton and not put in the three apartments that are supposed to be there. And they're asking for a variance, and the ZBA is not necessarily caring terribly much about that variance. And one of them is, you know, there's two market rate and one modest, you know, however they define that, um, apartments, and they're trying to like lop off an apartment and yet build a bigger building. So the town's trying, but as we all know, there's a lot of development pressure out here, but that development pressure really should be responsible for helping us all out. Mm. Um, it, it's, here, here. it's a huge issue. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. That's that. So, uh, as I said, it's 7.44. Wow, we went really over time. Thank you for being an amazing audience. Thank you to all of our incredible executive directors.